So one of the biggest challenges was now, how do we fit this monster shaft into this original or, or this EP motor? So we developed a shaft print. And then, you know, one of the limitations was the shaft has to be big enough diameter to, to be stiff enough to span. So we were trying to duplicate everything we could up to the point of where it fits the rotor body of the original. But that actually, there were some limitations there because that diameter was actually bigger than what we could do in the rotor. So we had to do another design assessment. Um, we had to evaluate how big of a hole could we bore out of this spider and still have mechanical integrity? So that assessment was performed completely different. We were looking at the rotational, the magnetic forces, the weights, the rotational forces, all the things at play. And then we were looking at that with 4140 steel. Uh, we felt was a good choice of steel. And then we were looking at the impact of the dovetail because one of the problems you have is when you when we cut out a bigger hole and I'll have a picture, we were getting closer to the dovetail. And so mechanically, we were concerned about that maybe being a point of fracturing or issues. So those calculations were performed and we identified that we could do it and we could do it to a diameter. And here was the thing. Remember that original shorting ring? I just kind of highlighted that. Well, that same shorter ring was limiting us to how big of a diameter we could go because we didn't want to mess with that system that would require redesigning it again. We were going to use that same idea. So that was about 16.25 inches, and that's what the number that was used in those calculations, and it all panned out. So cut the shaft of the original motor off, rotor off. That had to go to, it wouldn't, we couldn't line it properly in our lathe and have a true bore. So it had to go to a boring mill where they aligned it. They actually fly cutter, fly cut this thing out to the bigger diameter. And the rotor then with the, the new hole cut through it. So keep in mind now we're using this rotor. We still gonna have to redesign the poles with the windings with that new shaft. So the shaft print was created from the laser scans and all the cross checks. Shaft was manufactured, being manufactured, turned in our large lathe. So here we are machining it, turning it down to the diameters and the sizes that we needed. And one of the most important points, that actually was a close to finish. I didn't get a picture of the rough. We rough machined it within about 125 thousandths of the diameter then it had to go through a stress relieving process. Because when you turn shafts that start like this down to this, you create a ton of stress on the metal. So you gotta do something with that. If you don't, you put it in operation, it will relieve itself in time and it will bend, you know, and cause major issues. So it has to go in an oven, has to be stress relieved. And it's quite a, it's a simple process, but it takes a while. You gotta ramp it up slow, and then ramp it down slow. So it was over 48, maybe even more hours that it was in the oven from ramping up, holding, and then ramping back down. <clears throat> Remember the new rotor spider was, now had to be positioned on the shaft. And I was talking to my dad earlier, um, the positioning of this was not easy. You know, in theory, you think, okay, just put the rotor onto the new shaft. Well, where? Where do I put it on the new shaft so that I'm within the mechanical limits of the bearings. So we created a shaft that had the identical details of the original, and we only had this room to play with, about 400 thousandths on each side. So about 400 thousandths, and I had to go, okay, I gotta place my rotor on the shaft, because if you understand magnetic center, the placement of the rotor and the stator determines the axial magnetic center. And that could be way off if we didn't try to calculate it. So again, had to think, how am I gonna do this? We can approximate, we can do different things, but we're gonna be off and we won't have that much movement of the stator to move it around. So this was very critical. So what we did is we went back to the CAD drawing. We said, okay, we know where the shaft is. We know where the shaft centered is on the bearings. So if we know that, I'm gonna superimpose the red line as that EP stator frame. And I'm gonna put that 
over the center line. And then within there, the, the frame is one thing, but the laminations were offset in the frame. They weren't in the center, they were offset. So the laminations are the green line and they're offset to the right. So what I did is I played around with the stator and I moved it around until I knew I was going to have adequate support and I knew that I had enough space to be able to wiggle it this way and this way for adjustment. And I said, okay, there's my position. Well, if you know about electric motors, a rotor follows the stator, so the laminations typically align. So I knew then that, okay, my rotor will align with my stator. Well, it got a little more complex because the rotor laminations are actually longer than the stator. But what we did is we just said, okay, here's the center and we're gonna overlap it. So what you're seeing is the rotor is the yellow line. So what I did is once I identified the rotor position here, I was able to transfer that back to where do I position it on the shaft. So that's what we did. We built the shaft, as I said earlier, we were picking the shaft up and uh, I think Jim, it, it soaked on dry ice for like 24 hours or something like that. So we had it in dry ice in the box but in addition to that, then we set it up, set it up on our test bed that has a hole for vertical motors, but it was a great spot to do it. Put this uh, angle bracket apparatus together to hold the shaft. And then we grabbed the rotor body. Now think about this for a second. The rotor isn't just gonna go on there, right? Even if you shrink the shaft, you're lucky if you get a half a thousandths on the shaft when you try to make molecules go in. The rotor had to be heated up in the oven. So we experimented, I did calculations to say the thermal expansion is gonna be this on that diameter. And, and I wasn't just gonna go on calculations. We put it in the oven and I said, okay, at 200 degrees, how much expansion at? 250 degrees, how big does the diameter get? At 300. We ended up at 300 because we didn't wanna have any issues. So this rotor is about 300 degrees. The guys have gloves on. They make it look really easy, but that's like a really hot thing that they're dealing with. So. And if you'll notice that guy right there is that guy right there. <laughs> um, anyway, they picked it up, centered it over the rotor, and then we slowly lowered it down. And to people that have done this, that's a really critical thing. Because when you're lowering that down, if you don't lower it consistently and keep it moving, the heat will transfer and it will lock it in position. <laughs> And, and you could be in the wrong position. So these guys were sweating bullets, um, literally, and we were lowering it down, there's Jim again. We found our sweet spot and we stopped. And I don't know what it took Jim, but it took maybe, what, 10 minutes for it to lock together to where we felt comfortable. So at that point, we picked it back up and we brought it back down, but it was in its position. So the next step was duplicating the slip rings. So we had taken our own dimensions. The laser scan had taken dimensions on the OD and details. In addition to that, we took conductivity readings. Conductivity is measuring the percent of uh, copper alloy that's in it as opposed to copper being 100%. So knowing what that is, because that affects the brush and the, and the uh, arcing and stuff that you deal with on the brush and the rings. So the rings were manufactured, a print was made and the rings were made, and I'm fast-tracking it. Uh, a lot of details had to be done, but the rings were made and they were mounted on the shaft. So then the coupling. Like I said before, they had no spare, they had no print. We did have those spare armatures, and thank goodness for that, but now think about this. The coupling faces weren't like perfectly flat faces that went together. One was a male and one was a female and we couldn't take the original motor apart. But fortunately we had the, that looks like a, fee, a male on the armature and we took the profile of that. I'm gonna keep going the laser scan. So we had them go on site and laser scan and we were able to reverse engineer it. And I'm fast tracking because here's the laser scan and all the details. We also measured it to cross check again to make sure and from that, we were able to develop a print, but I had to then reverse whatever I saw on the armature coupling. I had to make that a male or female on this coupling so that they mated together properly. There's a register fit right here that was important. 
Um, so we did that and couplings were made out of 4140 steel again, and then they were mounted on the shaft. 